Following the end of the Civil War, the United States is going to experience a period of significant economic growth. U.S. factories are going to start churning out products much cheaper and much faster than they had done before, to the point where the U.S. starts competing with Britain as the leading manufacturing nation in the world. Not only that, but the U.S. population is going to grow. We're going to see U.S. be at the forefront of certain technologies, like this new electricity that's going to come out at this time. And we're going to see the U.S. be at the forefront of art, architecture, and this is going to come along with significant urbanization. Prior to the end of the Civil War, most Americans lived in rural areas. That's going to change in the late 1800s as more and more people move to cities with increased industrialization means an increase in jobs. So we'll start to see places like this pop up. This is New York. New York is going to essentially grow not just outwards, not just grow population-wise, but new technologies are going to allow things like skyscrapers to start to emerge that hadn't been there previously. And this stuff is going to look cool. I mean, it's going to look pretty. It's going to be these tall buildings that had never uh, been seen before uh, are going to be replacing these old shabby buildings. And things are going to just look great. Art is going to explode as we, we see uh, some of this money go into the hands of artists to create uh, monuments uh, architecture like these designs these buildings here and we're gonna have just this period where wealth comes into the United States like it had never come in before now this seems great and it is going to be for some people but this period is known as the Gilded Age for a reason before we talk about the bad we should probably explain what the term Gilded Age means well what does it mean to be gilded and who came up with the term Gilded Age? Well, gilding is the process of covering something in a shiny metal. Gilded generally means gold. It's taken on a form, you know, where you can gild it. You can use that to refer to covering in silver. But it's basically covering an object in a precious metal to make it look like it's made entirely of that precious metal. So, you know, instead of having a bar of gold we just have a wooden block covered in gold but if you just look at it it looks like it's gold you don't realize there's wood in inside of it well Mark Twain is going to come to refer to this time period end of the Civil War 1865 to 1901 there are different dates for this Gilded Age um, as the Gilded Age because the way he sees it is man it's going to look impressive we are gonna see these skyscrapers there is a ton of money coming in the United States there is a lot of these new technologies this new art this new shiny cool stuff that's gonna sound impressive and look impressive the problem is it's only gonna be experienced by a handful of people because what's gonna happen during this Gilded Age is basically we're gonna see a handful of people robber barons some people refer to them start using these tricks of capitalism these loopholes that had never been used before because they couldn't be used before because the technology wasn't there transportation wasn't there to use these type of loopholes to essentially funnel all this incoming money into the hands of a few people so what we're going to experience is something you don't see very often in history most of the time quality of life improves as time goes by generally as humanity has proceeded through the generations things get better you get new technologies to make life easier you know new technologies permit you to work less spend more time on leisure activities this is going to be one of those time periods where that's not the case we're actually going to see for a significant portion of Americans things get worse more people people are going to work longer hours people's wages are going to go down and people are not going to have what they had before instead of being a family that lives in a one-room farmhouse or something now you're going to be a family living in an apartment sharing it with three other families things are actually going to get worse during this gilded age it's one of those rare times that this happens so what tom uh or mark twain is referring to when he says gilded age is basically this period where it looks shiny but for most Americans it's shit you know this is gold covering crap because the Gilded Age is sounds good on the outside but it's only a couple people that get to experience the shininess okay so in order to talk about this Gilded Age we need to talk about the politics of the Gilded Age what is it gonna be that's gonna allow these handful of Americans to basically improve themselves 
sort of at the uh, at the mercy of the rest of the United States? Why does life get so much better for a handful of people while it gets worse for most people? What happens and why does the government sort of allow this to happen? Well, there's a couple things I want you to think about when you think of Gilded Age politics. One is something we already talked about, that's corruption. Gilded Age politics is going to be known for corruption. Every politician, I shouldn't say every politician, a significant number of the politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, although Republicans are going to become synonymous for it because they're uh, uh, sort of introduced with this grand administration, but just about every politician is going to become corrupt. And almost the purpose of politics is going to turn from serving your community, helping your friends, your family, your your neighbors, helping other people out, to entering politics just to get money. It's going to be this time period where people use politics to enrich themselves. And I know that's nothing new. Uh, we had it before, and we obviously ha still have it today. But the Gilded Age is going to be unique in the level of corruption and just how ingrained it's going to be in politics. Now, we've already talked about some of the corruption under Grant. We talked about whiskey ring scandal. Um, you had these other things, fake postal routes, stuff like that. But the thing that's going to be most prominent, not just in Grant's administration, but in subsequent administrations throughout this Gilded Age, it's a specific form of corruption called the spoil system. So the spoil system's been around for a long time. It got most famous in American history with President Andrew Jackson. Basically, Jackson took over the presidency. When he did, he appointed friends of his into political positions. Now, the way Jackson did this spoil system was different. And basically, the spoil system comes from the idea that to the victor go the spoil. So if I won the political position, I can hand out jobs to whoever I want. The way it worked under Jackson was he wasn't necessarily doing it to make money, although I, I would argue that's part of it. But he was probably doing it because he thought, hey, the people chose me. They think my judgment is best, so I'm going to put my friends into office. So his was more about democracy, less about um, I'm going to put people in a position that can make me money. That's going to change in the Gilded Age. Essentially, politics will turn into you get a political position, you're going to use the power of this position to help out other people, knowing that those people will help you out politically or they're going to help you out financially. So let's say you become a postmaster general. You uh, are in charge of a number of post office routes. Well, now that in your position, Sure, a little bit of it might be to deliver the mail to people, but a lot of people are going to look at this, hey, you know what I can do here? I can start handing out mail routes to my buddy's kid. He uh, will run this mail route. You know, maybe the buddy's kid is incompetent. Um, he needs something on his resume to make him look like he's professional. So I'll give this to this guy's kid. It gets him a check. He probably doesn't know anything about delivering mail, but I do a favor for this guy over here. He looks at that, and he's going to scratch my back later. Thanks for giving my incompetent kid a job. Here's a couple bucks on the side. Or, hey, when there's an opening for state senate, something like that, I'm going to put you up, and I'm going to help finance your campaign. So you give somebody a job because it helps you out financially or it helps you out politically. Um, and we're going to see this all throughout uh, political uh politics, not just Republicans, but Democrats as well. You get into position of power, you scratch somebody else's back, they scratch yours. And I think the best way to illustrate this spoil system is to probably, or is to look at probably the most, uh, the person that most benefited from the spoil system in American history. It's this guy, Chester Arthur, okay? Chester Arthur was a member of the Republican Party. Now, Chester Arthur is different than Ulysses S. Grant, different than Abraham Lincoln. He's different than those Republicans we've been talking about during Reconstruction. The Republican Party has gone through this transformation. So started as an anti-slavery party, then it became this reform party. Well, as Reconstruction went on, some Republicans kind of got tired of the reform element and they wanted to focus on the pro-business element of the Republican Party. So when the Republican Party went out, came out, it, it was partly 
anti-slavery, the significant portion was anti-slavery, but some people, in order to, to get votes in the North, were going to help out business. Uh, you know, we're going to use the government to help out business. Well, as Reconstruction went on, a lot of these pro-business people, parts of the Republican Party, said, we've done enough reform. We should make it our, our job to help out business, and in particular, industry. These manufacturers that take raw goods and turn it into finished goods. So take tobacco, turn it into a cigar, and then you could sell that cigar much cheaper than you could sell raw tobacco. Uh, manufacturers that take cotton, turn it into a shirt because you can sell that shirt for much more than you can sell the cotton. So we had these guys that wanted to use the power of government to help out businesses, some of them because they thought this would be good for the United States. We outcompete Britain in manufacturing. Britain had gotten to the top position in the world because it was the dominant in manufacturing. But if we outcompete them, we can start leading on the world stage. Well, Chester Arthur is one of those pro-business Republicans. He basically, let's get over the reform, we're done with that, and let's focus on helping out American business. But Chester Arthur is also corrupt, okay? So you don't need to know much about his background. Just know, member of the Republican Party, the pro-business faction of the Republican Party, he uh been a lawyer in New York. He's eventually going to get appointed to this position, this federal government position called the New York Port Duty Collector. So makes his way up, becomes friends with the uh, buddies in the, the Republican Party. Um, he's going to get appointed New York Port Duty Collector. Now, this sounds like an incredibly boring position, New York Port Duty Collector. It's so hard to say, and it's equally it sounds equally as boring. And while it is boring, it is important. So the United States, the government, gets its money uh, at this time from just a couple sources. We've talked previously about the whiskey tax. You have these whiskey tax collectors, um, these alcohol tax collectors that go count these barrels. U.S. takes some of that money and, and gets uh, income that way. Doesn't have a income tax. They just don't have that yet. So that's not available. But probably the biggest way the U.S. makes its money at this time, the money to pay soldiers, stuff like that, uh, the U.S. government collects import and export duties, okay? So whenever a product leaves the United States for an overseas port or for another country, it's got to pass through a duty collector. So I want you to think about these guys as guys sitting at the end of the docks with a clipboard. They count up how much, uh, how many items are leaving the United States. They're going to collect an export duty. They're going to collect an import duty on these items when they come back in. Uh, so these items are going to sell for $100. U.S. government wants $10, okay? And then that $10 goes to pay U.S. soldiers or whoever. So it's a percentage of imports and exports and that's how the US gets most of its money for all of US government stuff well New York port duty collector is very important in this duty collection because almost all goods in this area the Midwest and this is a huge manufacturing area as well as this region around here they're gonna end up going through New York before they leave for overseas so if something's produced in, let's say, uh, St. Louis, let's say um, Chicago, something like that, it will end up, in order to get to market overseas, it's going to end up going through these Great Lakes, probably either getting on a railroad or going on uh, the Erie Canal, uh, something like that. Then it's going to make its way down to New York, and it's going to be, before it can go out overseas to market, it's got to stop at this New York port duty collection office where these guys on the clipboard are going to count how many products are there and they're going to take a percentage of it. So this is, as a matter of fact, about 50% of U.S. goods are shipped out of New York or in through New York uh, when uh, Chester Arthur is appointed to this office. So Chester Arthur is going to be responsible for a significant portion of the U.S. budget and this comes along with a huge labor force. Okay, You need people to count up the products you need people to uh, make sure to collect this money and as a matter of fact Chester Arthur is going to be in charge of about a thousand jobs now Chester Arthur was a good a politician or a good person at his job he'd hire the best people for his job or if this was a different time period he'd hire people that are just darn good duty collectors but he's not Chester Arthur's a product of 
the spoil system, this weird po politics post-Civil War where you hand out jobs to friends in order for them to do you favors. So when he takes over as New York Port Duty Collector, Chester Arthur is just going to start handing out jobs to people that can do him favors. Hey, you have a, an incompetent son. Um, why doesn't he become duty collector at this dock? Okay. Um, hey, this is going to make you look good because, um, you know, your son's now not a worthless kid. He's, he's now got a, a nice government job. Hey, you over here, I'll give you this nice job. Why don't you slide me a couple books? Hey, you over here, you fellow Republican, I want to be something besides New York Port Duty Collector one day. I'm going to go ahead and give you this job. You scratch my back at an upcoming political convention, something like that. So he starts doing favors for members of the Republican Party, uh, giving out government jobs to people that are unqualified for his own financial and personal benefit. This is going to get so bad that he's actually going to be investigated by Rutherford B. Hayes. So we talked about last time Rutherford B. Hayes uh, takes over the presidency 1877 after this bargain made um, uh, with the Democratic Party. He gets into office. He's not going to get very much done. A lot of people look at him as having taken office because uh, not because he was qualified, but because those states were illegally given to him. Um, a lot of people see him as undeserving of the presidency, not because he's a bad dude. Again, Rutherford B. Hayes himself isn't corrupt, but just the conditions upon which he came into office. But Rutherford B. Hayes, because he's an honest guy and because he sort of wants to shed this corruption charge or this sort of undeserving of the presidency charge, he is going to start being hard on corruption. And one of the first things he's going to do as president, he hears about what's happening at the Nor New York Port Duty Collection Office. He hears that things aren't going the way they should. Uh, Chester Arthur's using his position to enrich himself. So Rutherford B. Hayes is going to send federal investigators to the New York Port Duty Collection Office to see what Chester Arthur is up to. They determine that he's running the thing poorly. He is handing out jobs to unqualified people. He is using his position to uh, better himself, not properly collect duties as he's supposed to be doing. Well, Chester Arthur, Arthur I'm sorry, Rutherford B. Hayes, after learning this about Chester Arthur, is going to fire uh, Chester Arthur. You're out of here. Um, you're, uh, you know, this is uh, unbecoming of your office. You're fired. He fires him. He's going to replace him as New York Port Duty Collector. Well, here's the thing. So that should be the end of Chester Arthur. And it probably would be at any other time in history, except we're going to see another element of the Gilded Age come about. And that's going to be something called machine politics. Chester Arthur had done so many favors for members of the Republican Party uh, while he was New York Port Duty Collector, in spite of the fact he got fired by fellow Republican Rutherford B. Hayes, that when Republicans are going to choose a new presidential candidate at the 1880 Republican nominating convention, a number of pro-business Republicans are going to propose that Chester Arthur be their candidate. Okay, So to talk about that, we need to talk about how presidential candidates are chosen. So today, if you, um, uh, you know, if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, how do you choose your candidate who you're going to run for president? Well, today what we do is something called primaries, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. But you basically, it's done differently. Every state does it differently. But members of the political party in general, they go to a voting booth, they have these candidates that are running, and then they choose Bill Bilson will be you know, or Steve Stevenson or Tom Thompson, whoever. These are going to be the people that are running for the Republican Party candidate. I think Bill Bilson's the most qualified for the job. You know, I vote for him. Then Texas does it, Louisiana does it, Oklahoma does it, whatever. And at the end of it, basically the Republicans hold a convention. Everybody knows who, who's going to be the candidate before then, but they basically hold this vote and they say, Texas goes for whoever, Louisiana goes for whoever, Oklahoma goes for whoever, and then that's the Republican candidate. Dem Democratic Party does the same thing. The whole Texas Democratic Party holds its vote, uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma, all the different states. So they hold primaries, they hold votes to choose a candidate. That's not the way it used to be done. 
what the way they used to be done in the 1800s and into the 1900s is the p prominent political party members would just meet up at a convention every year. So just think about this as random guy, member of the Republican Party from Nevada. All right, so Nevada, whatever, you know, 20,000 Republicans, members of the Republican Party. There's a couple prominent leaders, and basically they run the Nevada branch of the Republican Party. Well, every year, the Republican Party is going to say, send your top guys, meet up at this convention. Same thing with Massachusetts, whatever, Maine, wherever. You send your prominent Republican Party leaders. These guys show up at the convention, and they're going to debate and pick a party member. They don't know who it is just yet. There's no voting beforehand. It's just top higher-ups in the party are going to choose who the candidate will be. Very different than what we have today. Well, this is going to happen at the 1880 Republican nominating convention. So all these Republican Party leaders are going to show up. And this is a time when the party is incredibly divided. You've got guys that want to continue with Reconstruction say, we haven't done enough. We're the party of reform. Look what's starting to happen down in the South. We, we've started to see the uh, Democrats in power getting rid of uh, 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 disenfranchising blacks, things like that. You have uh, members of these Republican parties saying, we got to put a halt to that. We should take up for this. Others talking about different reform issues. And then you have this pro-business faction of the Republican Party. Guys like Chester Arthur saying, we're done with reform. Let's focus on economic growth. Well, a lot of these pro-business guys, they look at Chester Arthur. This guy scratched my back. He helped me out. Let's put him up there. And I know if he becomes president, president has a lot of jobs he can hand out. Maybe he can help me uh, make me secretary of whatever, secretary of, uh, of the interior or something like that. So you're going to see this pro-business faction some are going to push for Chester Arthur. Now, the Reform Republicans, they don't like it. Some of the pro-business Republicans don't like him either. Um, and so there's going to be this big argument. What direction should we take the party? Well, in the midst of this nominating convention, you're going to have people go up and propose their candidates. So one guy will say, I think I nominate Steve Stevenson. I think he's the best for uh, for uniting the party. I think the people will vote for him, and I think he's going to be the best president. Well, one guy, a uh, guy from Ohio, his name is uh, James Garfield, is going to get up in front of the convention, and he's going to make a speech, not for himself, but a friend of his, another member of this Republican Party. Now, when James Garfield gets up to make a speech, Nobody really knows him. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Okay, James Garfield, I don't know. It, it doesn't matter. And it's not going to matter initially because he's not up there to talk about himself. He's to talk about his friend. So James Garfield's going to get up there intending to get the audience to vote for his friend. And he's going to make this eloquent speech. Basically, he's going to say, listen, we're at the crossroads here. We've got this party that is divided right now. We've accomplished a lot, but we need to go further. I think that there's a way that we can improve the American economy while also continuing on with reform. We can't let the Democrats uh, win the presidency in 1880. We've got to choose a strong candidate. We've got to pick my friend here. The speech he makes is just going to be so eloquent that everybody at this convention is going to say, well, who the hell is this guy? You know, forget the guy that he's talking about. Who is this James Garfield guy? What they're going to find out is that James Garfield is incredibly impressive. So James Garfield uh, will grow up in Ohio to a fairly poor family. Uh, they're poor in part because his dad's going to die at a young age. Um, and so Jar Garfield will end up becoming sort of the man of the house at a young age. He's going to have to go to work early to support his family. Uh, in this regard, he's going to become a ditch digger. Uh, he'll be digging canals uh, uh, throughout Ohio. Um, and he's going to be doing this, and it kind of looks like, as a teenager, this is what he's going to be doing throughout the rest of his life. Well, his family and his neighbors, they notice that Garfield has something. The kid is, you know, intelligent. He's a really smart kid. And a lot of these guys think, this guy shouldn't be digging ditches. He He's destined for more. So 
uh, when he's uh, later in his teenage years, his family and neighbors are going to raise money to send J James Garfield off to college and institute a higher education. Garfield is going to go to this school, and he's going to be so impressive that he not only graduates in a year, he actually starts teaching there in a year, okay? Um, and then by 26, he's actually the head of the college, all right? He's incredibly smart. The guy's so smart, he has a mathematical proof. Now, if you're a math major, you probably know what this is. If you're not, what it is, basically, he comes up with a concept in math that is, is a something that is true in math. So, like, uh, Pythagorean theorem, he comes up with one of those. No, it's incredibly hard to come up with a mathematical proof, especially uh, these days, but really past uh, ancient times. It's very rare for people to come up with a mathematical proof. James Garfield develops one. He's that smart. He's so smart, apparently, that he could, uh, he knew multiple languages, and he could write in uh, Greek with his right hand while writing with Latin in his left hand. Incredibly smart guy. Really uh, incredibly smart. Very forward thinking. So, he was an original member of the Republican Party. He was a radical Republican uh, before most Republicans were radical Republicans and most were moderates. Before the Civil War, he was calling for abolitionism. We not, we not only need to stop the spread of slavery, we need to end it where it currently exists. Again, most Republicans before the Civil War were not in that camp. Uh, Garfield was, and he was one of the few that were talking about equal rights for blacks, and he's going to be, uh, again, uh, sort of the forefront of this uh, abolitionist thought. Um, so he's, he's very progressive in his views. Not only that, he has significant military experience. So Civil War breaks out. When it does, 1861, Garfield tries to enlist as an officer. He goes, I'm educated. Uh, I want to serve in the military. Well, these guys say, well, what do you do? Uh, you know, I'm basically a teacher and educator. They say, we don't need that. We need officers who military experience or officers who have um, engineering experience. We don't think you qualify as an officer. So they initially rejected Garfield, and he was planning to just go and enlist. But he sort of pushed back, finally became an officer. And he's so good at his job that in a year, uh, in just a little over a year, he had gone from barely being able to enter as an officer to becoming a general uh, for his leadership on the battlefield. As a matter of fact, there was one battle where Confederates were uh, about to sneak up and, and attack Ulysses S. Grant. Garfield uh, cut them off, uh, preventing them from attacking them. So he's a, he's a military genius. Uh, so not only intelligent, uh, forward-thinking, but also uh, a badass. Uh, so during the Civil War, he served in the military. Not just that, but towards the end of the war, there was going to be a vacant position in the U.S. House of Representatives for Ohio. Garfield's going to fill this temporarily. Uh, he does so good at his job that he's going to run for re-election, be elected, and he's going to serve nine terms in the House of Representatives. Now, during his time in the House of Representatives, he's not... Uh, He's not very outspoken, but he is going to be one of those guys that is pushing for major reforms, uh, pushing for black rights, things like that. Again, you know, sort of at the forefront, whereas other Republicans are, are sort of uh, take a couple years to get there. Garfield's one of the first to be pushing for uh, major things like the 14th Amendment, uh, 15th Amendment, things like that. So during this time and all this, he hadn't really a made a name because... He just didn't talk very much. But now, at the 1880 nominating convention, after he speaks, the people are going to say, well, forget this guy's buddy. I think that guy should be the candidate. And when the first round of voting, so after all the candidates are nominated, there's going to be a vote, and it takes a majority of, of the convention to pick a candidate. Well, after the first round of votes, uh, Garfield ends up with, like 20% of the vote, and he's going to have to get, guys, I, I don't want it. Dude, nominate my buddy. I'm, I'm not running. And he's going to, whatever, dude. Second round of votes, wins even more votes. Dudes, I don't I don't even want to be president. And he's going to have to keep pushing back, pushing back. Uh, eventually, he's going to end up getting a majority, and they're going to want him to be their candidate. So he didn't want to run for president, but he's going to end up being the Republican Party nominee. Now, the thing is, Garfield would be a reform Republican, and this is at a time when you have this split in the Republican Party. So the pro-business Republicans are going to want 
to have their own representation. They're going to want to have a guy who, uh, uh, one of their guys to be vice president. Well, this is where it's going to get interesting because they're going to insist on Chester Arthur being the VP. So you have a reform guy as the president, presidential candidate, and a pro-business guy as the VP. Well, these guys become the Republican Party ticket, and it's at this point, you know, they start campaigning, stuff like that. And uh, this is actually going to be a very close race. You don't know, have to know who the Democrats run. Just know that um, James Garfield will end up winning the presidency barely, okay? The only reason he's going to win is because he wins New York. And New York's sort of this swing state where the Democrats, uh, you know, they have this... Uh, uh, sometimes New York swings to Democrats. Sometimes it's going to swing to Republicans. Well, Garfield barely wins. He actually probably owes a little bit to Chester Arthur being uh, from New York uh, for his success. But he barely, barely, barely wins. And because he wins New York, this is going to throw enough electoral votes to where Garfield will become president. So Garfield, when he becomes president or when he, it's apparent he's won the presidency, he's going to make it clear I want to push for civil rights reform. I want universal education he's going to call for. He's going to basically call on, you know, the pro-business party to understand we do want economic growth, but we need to continue with reform. And this is a guy who's pr probably uniquely qualified to be president. I mean, again, military experience, incredibly intelligent, uh, you know, uh, a, a guy that's a, a smart, forward thinker. With this guy in office, coming into office in March 1881, it seems like the United States is about to head to utopia. And we, everybody knows what happens. Garfield uh, institutes universal education, uh, everything, uh, reform mind, uh, reforms in the South, everything's great, the U.S. economy does fantastic, and everything's going to be perfect because James Garfield becomes president and everything's good. No. James Garfield is not going to be president for very long because of this guy. This guy's name is Charles Guteau, okay? Charles Guteau is weird, okay? I want you to think about Charles Guteau like that weird friend you have who makes up relationships with celebrities, all right? Uh, when I was growing up, I had a friend who swore up and down that Tiger Woods, he, the guy worked at a, a kitchen in a golf course. And, you know, there's the restaurants each golf course had. This guy worked in the kitchen. He swore up and down that Tiger Woods came in and taught him how to make a sandwich. He came to the party one night. And he's like, guys, just met Tiger Woods today. Taught me how to make a sandwich. Somebody pointed out to him, Tiger Woods is playing golf in Florida today. There's no way he could have taught you to make a sandwich. The guy couldn't stop lying. He basically said, oh, he did. He flew a helicopter in. There's no benefit in this. We wouldn't even thought he would. He was cool if, if Tiger Woods made him a sandwich, but he insisted upon it. I think we all have weird friends or weird acquaintances like that that sort of have this disconnect with reality. That's Charles Guteau. He's not exactly there. And, and you can kind of see in the eyes this is a person who isn't exactly connected to reality. Now, part of the reason that He's like this is Guteau has a unique background. He grew up in a cult. Uh, he grew up in New York as a member of this Oneida cult. Um, Oneida, you might know him because of uh, silverware. I don't think they, uh, the actual cult produces anymore, but the name came from this cult that would make silverware, uh, and, and that's how they made their money. But it's basically a free love community. He was born into this Oneida community, and he was raised in this community where the religious belief was if you have multiple sexual partners, that's sort of the path to God. Well, Charles Guteau was so weird that uh, basically, even though sex was sort of the path to God, None of the girls in the cult would sleep with him. He was he was that weird. They they called him creepy. They said he smelled bad. And at the age of 18, he's actually going to get kicked out of the cult. Now, it's going to be hard to do getting kicked out of a cult, but uh, Charles Guteau managed to do it because he's creepy. So, 18 years old, Guteau is going to be set out into the world. Now, as a member of the Oneidas, he had received an education. He knew how to read and write. 
but again, he's not exactly there. So what he's going to do uh, from 18 on is he's going to be sort of a vagabond, ne'er-do-well con man. Some people will call him a con man. Uh, what he'll do a lot of times is he'll go from one town to another, uh, going to hotels, and basically what he'd say at the hotels is um, he'd pretend to be a famous person. He'd say, I'm a famous lawyer is what he would do a lot of the times. And he would um, say to the, the uh, person running the hotel, I'm famous so-and-so. Um, I'm about to argue a case here. I don't have my money uh, right now, but I'm about to get paid on, you know, two weeks or whatever. Uh, can I stay here until this money comes in, and then I'll pay you when, when it comes in? And he stays there till the day before the money's uh, due. Then when it's due, he would take off. He would actually actually practice as a lawyer occasionally. He would get clients, you know, accused of robbery or trying to, you know, property dispute, something like that. And Guteau would go to court and he would pretend to be a lawyer, but he would do so badly. Like, so uh, there are accounts where he would actually show up to court because he wanted to get paid. A lot of times he'd get paid in advance and just take off, but there's sometimes he would show up and people would say, all right, well, defend me, Guto. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And he would just sit there and just make a fool of himself and a fool of his client. Um, so that's one thing Guto would do. He would uh, practice sort of a religious... Um, uh, his own version of religion. So Guteau, uh he's uh, going to write his own Bible at one point. And you can look this up on Google Books if you want. There's a, It's called, I think, The Truth by Charles Guteau. Uh But Guteau comes up with his own religious theories, sort of this uh, branch of Christianity. And if you look this thing up, it's incredibly boring. I wish I could recommend reading it. And Guteau is talking about, you know, crazy unicorns or something. But it's just boring. It says, don't bowl and stuff like that. Uh, but he comes up with this weird religion and writes this whole text. And he goes and tries to get this thing published by major publishers. They're like, I don't want, nobody's going to read this. This is stupid. Nobody's going to buy into your religion, Charles Guteau. So what he ends up doing is he finds a guy that essentially has a printer in their garage. And he tells this guy, print my, um, print my, my book. Uh, I'm going to pay you two weeks from now. Um, you know, once you print this thing out, uh, and, and you'll get paid later. Well, this poor guy prints out something like 2,000 copies of Charles Guteau's book. Um, Charles Guteau is going to grab a bunch of these uh, and take off. And it's a actually kind of interesting because he has the guy printing it. I, I don't want the name of your low-rent uh, printing press on there. Why don't you put the name of, of one of the big printing companies on there? So it looks like it's printed by a major publisher, but in reality it's just some Joe Schmo. And this poor guy um, is going to end up with all these copies of, of the truth uh, and nobody's willing to buy them. So he's sort of a vagabond, a theologian, you know, a, a fake lawyer, a con man. Well, in his sort of travels, Guteau is going to end up in New York City right during the 1880 presidential campaign. So the way that presidential can uh, candidates used to campaign at the time was they didn't have TV. They didn't have radio yet. So a lot of times what they would do to get to undecided voters is they would hire people to make speeches in crowded places. So I don't know exactly where Guteau made his speech, but the way they would do it a lot of times is they would just say, hey, can you read? Can you write? Um, yeah, I can do all that. All right, I want you to read this speech in, uh, let's go with Grand Central Station or something like that, a crowded place where a lot of people are gathering. And these speech givers, they're not even members of the Republican Party. They're just people that go out and yell what the candidates' positions are. So Garfield believes that uh, in reform. Garfield believes in, you know, big business. You know, Garfield believes in economic progress. Garfield believes in this. And they say it in the hopes that somebody will say, oh, I didn't know that about Garfield. Uh, I'm going to listen to what this guy has to say. So it's just almost like a town crier uh, for these political uh, candidates. Well, Guteau, he's going to get this speech. Um, he actually edits it a, a lot. And he's going to go out and uh, hired by this Republican Party. Again, they don't know anything other than him other than he can read and he goes out and apparently he delivers just this horrible speech like he just sitting there trying to read 
James Gar Gar Garfield is is neato and he he's a good candidate and he he's really cool and and he just messes the whole thing up. Like he he probably lost James Garfield a number of votes. You know, wow. You know, if if James Garfield's got this guy speaking for him, I don't want to vote for him. But in Charles Guteau's mind, he delivered such an eloquent speech and such a perfect speech that he thinks he's going to win James Garfield, New York, okay? So he delivers the speech, and at election day, James Garfield barely wins New York, and because he wins New York, he wins the presidency. So in Charles Guteau's minds, he has just delivered the presidency to James Garfield. Now, Guteau is thinking, this is the age of the spoil system, I just did Garfield a favor, so he needs to do me a favor by giving me a job, all right? So Guteau is going to be sitting, you know, probably at the boarding house or whatever, thinking that Garfield will reward him for handing him the presidency. And the way he's thinking is that Garfield is going to appoint him to be an ambassador. Garfield's going to appoint him to be, um, uh, you know, some prominent position. As a matter of fact, Guteau thinks that he'll be appointed ambassador to France, which is second most powerful country in the world at the time, Britain and then France, United States a little bit after that. Um, but he thinks he's going to be the U.S. representative to France. And he's sitting there and he's waiting around. All right, this this letter from Garfield's going to come at any time uh, very shortly. All right, where's the letter? What's going on here? Does he not know where I'm at? And eventually, Garfield will take over the presidency in March 1881 without sending Guteau letter. And this makes sense because James Garfield doesn't know who Charles Guteau is. Guteau is one of a thousand different speechwriters Republicans uh, hired. They, they were just nameless sort of uh, 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 message deliverers. So he doesn't know who Guteau is, but Guteau doesn't realize that. And so he thinks Garfield has forgotten about him. So he's going to move from New York to Washington, D.C., and he's going to start following James Garfield around, trying to make appointments with him, the, you know, uh, Garfield's secretary is going to be, I don't know who you are. You can't make an appointment with the president. Eventually, at one point, uh, Guteau will be uh, getting an appointment with uh, Garfield's secretary of state, uh, a guy named James G. Blaine. He, you don't need to know about him, but he's like, I, you didn't, what do you, you didn't even do anything. You're not going to get any political position. Kicks Guteau out. Guteau actually starts to follow Garfield around. At one point, Garfield remarks like, who's this weird dude, you know, behind me? That's really the only think Garfield ever says about the guy. Um, but Guteau is going to see himself being ignored, and he's going to get this idea in his mind that James Garfield is not, not only not his friend, but James Garfield is the devil. Guteau thinks that he's basically being denying him a job because Garfield is evil. And Guteau is going to start this weird relationship with Garfield in his head where he thinks it's his responsibility to eliminate the devil and help the American people, and he's going to do it by assassinating James Garfield. So Guteau's going to buy a pistol, and he's going to plan out how to assassinate Garfield. He's going to start reading these newspapers, and he's going to learn uh, that Garfield is going to be using, uh, uh, be uh, on a train in uh, July to um, uh, to go to, I believe it's Gar Garville's going to New York or something like that, but he's going to be passing through a train station. So July 2nd, uh, he actually, I should say, right before this, Guteau is going to write letters to all these newspapers the day before he's planning to assassinate Garfield, and he's going to say, this is what I'm about to do. He's going to include a copy of his uh, Bible, The Truth, and he's going to say, the, here's why I'm assassinating Garfield. You can thank me later. And actually what he thinks is going to happen is that once Garfield's dead, the American people are going to say, don't don't uh, lock him up. He he saved us all. And Chester Arthur is going to pardon him when he becomes president. Um, day before he sends these letters out, he also actually goes to visit the jail because he thinks, I'm going to briefly get thrown in jail before the people liberate me. And so he visits to make sure the accommodations are good. He says, you know, can I check out your jail? Jailer's like, why the hell do you want to come in here? But anyway, uh, uh, they think it's a little suspicious, but they don't think anything uh, beyond that. Um, so he makes this tour, and then July 2nd, the day that 
uh, Garfield's intending to go through this uh, train station. Goto is going to get a taxi, uh, carriage, uh, horse and buggy, and he's going to tell the person to wait outside the train station. He's going to basically say, hey, dude, stay here. I need a, uh, I need, I'm, I'm going to be in there for a couple minutes. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to need a ride to this jail over here. Uh, here's a couple bucks. Wait for me. You know, the horse and buggy driver, like, all right, whatever, weirdo. Uh, and anyway, Charles Guteau's going to go in and wait for James Garfield. Well, James Garfield's going to come in July 2nd, intending to get on this train. When he does, Charles Guteau's going to come up behind him, uh, aim a gun into his back, shoot Garfield in the back shoots Scarfield in the back. Guteau is going to be um, wrestled to the ground. He's going to be brought to jail, but Garfield's going to be sitting there uh, laying on the ground, start vomiting everywhere. We'll talk about what happens to Guteau in a second here, but now you have President Garfield. So it's July. He just took over the presidency in March. So, you know, end of March. So we got April, May, June, three and a half months. Basically, he's been president. Now he's been shot in the back. Well, Garfield laying there on the floor of the train station, bleeding, um, you know, not bleeding too much, but bleeding. Basically, uh, some members of his party are going to drag him to a, a floor, you know, to a side room in the train station. And what we're going to have is word go out, the president's been shot. And so doctors from all around are going to start, hey, I want to be the one to save the president. And so they're going to start heading to this train station. They're going to lean over, Mr. President, I'm a doctor. And what they're going to start doing is trying to dig the bullet out. Now, at the time, they don't know a lot about germs. The idea of germs in in uh, Europe at the time is being worked out. We'll talk about that in a second. But people don't have the same understanding of sanitation we have today. So this first doctor is going to look there. He wants to get the bullet out because, you know, if you get the bullet out and generally it, you know, wounds are going to heal better. So this guy's going to reach in there and go... <laughs> And he's reaching in there with hands that are uh, just been touching this train floor. And these train floors are uh, floors where people have been walking through horse poop, dragging that through there. Now, this doctor has his hands on the floor, uh, you know, whatever, feces all over it, just sticks it in there and tries to get the bullet out. Next doctor shows up. Oh, you're not doing it right. Let me go in there. <laughs> Goes in there, tries to reach in, get the bullet. Uh, nothing, not able to get it. Next doctor, guys, move out of the way. I'm going to get it. <laughs> Goes in there trying to get it. Can't get this thing out. More germs introduced this. More germs introduced to this. Well, Garfield is eventually going to be uh, brought out of the, the uh, train station, and he's going to be put in a bed in the White House um, where he's going to get an infection. You know, uh, he's going to start to develop sepsis, uh, start to sweat um, as the germs start to infect his wounds of his body. Um, they're actually going to build the first, what you call, air conditioner. It's basically just ice blowing on him uh, to keep him uh, cool because his temperature is going to get so much. Back then, you know, the hospitals weren't as sanitary and as clean as they are today, so the best place to treat people a lot of times was at home. And James Garfield's doctor is going to be uh, uh, treating him. Well, Garfield's doctor is also going to be trying to get this bullet out of his back. He's going to be reaching in there, <laughs> trying to grab the bullet um, out of the back. But, um, um, again, you know, goes in there. And actually his doctor is going to start digging along the channel that the previous doctor had, had dug where he thinks the bullet went in. So imagine Garfield's back. He's going to start digging along this one side. Okay, the bullet's just in over here. Uh, I'm going to get it. Uh, I can't get it. It must be up there a little bit more. Reaches in another time uh, using tools and stuff. But uh, uh, actually, sometimes they just use, straight up use their hands. But trying to get this bullet out. Now, he can't find the bullet. So at one point, he actually calls in Alexander Graham Bell, who we're not going to get to talk about, the guy that developed the telephone, who also had invented um, early metal detection device. He's going to come in with this metal detector, put it over Garfield's body, and he starts putting it where at the area where the doctor think the bull, thinks the bullet is, uh, starts uh, putting in that area, and it's going to start going off. And beep, 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 okay, that must be where the bullet is. Unfortunately for James Garfield, uh, Alexander Graham Bell's machine was probably picking up uh, the bed spring under Garfield's bed. So uh, the doctor 
um, will continue to think that the bullet's in this one area, keeps digging in, can't find the bullet, keeps digging in, can't find the bullet. By September, Garfield is incredibly sick. He actually gets pus pockets all over his body. He gets one in his sinus cavity. He actually gets so big it bursts, almost drowns him in his own pus. Eventually, his uh, uh, fever is going to get too much to the point where he will die in September. Okay, um, he, We're going to basically have a presidential assassination. It takes a long time for him to die, but he does die in September. Okay, um, Now, before we go on to talk about what this means for the U.S., I do want to uh, close up what's going to happen to Guiteau. Guiteau afterwards had been locked up in prison. He again is sitting here thinking, all right, I'm going to get uh, broken out, but quickly the American public, well, I'm not going to lock you, or I'm not going to break you out, crazy guy. Um, uh, Guiteau, he's, he's uh, uh, by the way, if, if people, uh, if this had happened in recent times, people would be crying conspiracy because, uh, you know, he's going to say, Chester Arthur's going to help me out, uh, things like that. There really is no conspiracy. The guy's just crazy. As a matter of fact, uh, his lawyer is going to try to try uh, try to, to get him off on the uh, uh, murder charges by saying that he's insane. So this is not guilty by reason of insanity. But um, Guteau's going to be like, no, I'm sane. What are you talking about? And the lawyer's going to be like, dude, shut up. You know, you're, you're insane. And he really is insane, but uh, the, the uh, judge isn't going to buy that argument, and the jury won't either. He will end up being convicted and murdered, and uh, he's going to be carried out. Um, uh, the execution, he's going to be ordered executed, and that's going to be carried out um, in, in 1882. Uh, so he he dies. He's going to be executed. So he's out of the picture. So, you know, he's out of the picture, but what does this assassination mean? Like, what is going to come out of it? Well, I don't know if you can measure this, but immediately after this, people are going to realize we kind of messed up the way that we treated Garfield. They actually perform an autopsy of Garfield, and when they cut open his back, they're going to find two separate channels. They're going to find one clean channel where the bullet went in and this bullet just went through muscle and fat and sort of lodged itself in into his back in this muscle fat area and then it had healed itself up really nicely uh, nothing wrong with that but then you're gonna look at this other channel where there's pus pockets everywhere it's just gross it's just uh, you know this infected area where the doctors had been digging in on the opposite side of his body Garfield honestly would have been fine if the first doctor to show up said, he's good, let's just sew him up, let's not mess around in there. But the doctors, you can almost say, killed him as much as uh, as Guteau did. Well, right after this, you're going to start seeing doctors in the United States pay attention to the work of a guy named Joseph Lister. Lister is sort of the inventor of germ theory in Europe. The name Listerine, this is that comes from Joseph Lister. But he determined that uh, these little microscopic germs cause infection, and you, if you have an open wound, uh, the best w thing you should do is to sanitize your hands, your equipment, before treating somebody. So he'd come up with this idea of using carbolic acid to basically kill the microbes on your hand. And after people started using that in Europe, you saw significantly less death rates due to infection. The idea would have eventually made its way over to the United States, uh, but it's going to make its way over a lot quicker um, following uh, Garfield's death. People are going to start looking around and saying, what we did here isn't right. Maybe this guy in Europe has his stuff together. So, I mean, Garfield getting killed, at least he probably saved a couple hundred or thousand lives by adopting these sanitary methods a little bit earlier. That's something you can't exactly measure. One thing you can measure is that immediately after Garfield's death, uh, we're going to have this Chester Arthur guy take over. He takes over the presidency, and a lot of people are going to say, what are you going to do to make sure this type of thing doesn't happen? Because one thing people are going to take out of this is that Guteau, they're not going to take out of this that Guteau killed Garfield because he was insane. He was insane. That's the reason why he killed him. But a lot of people are going to look at Guteau and they're going to say, he killed him because he expected a job, because the spoils system is rampant. So 
Guto is a product of the spoil system. We have this corrupt system where people expect jobs for doing favors for one another, not because they're qualified. So this guy killed Garfield because he didn't get the job he wanted. Partly true, the real truth is Guto is insane, but that's not how the American public is going to take it. American public, whenever something happens, they always take one lesson, and that becomes the major lesson. So the people see this as... This is a guy who wants an office, and he didn't get in his office, and uh, and and so he's upset. You got this cartoon say a model office secret. This is what it's become. Politics have become is this spoil system. Now Chester Arthur becomes president. He's a product of the spoil system. This guy got to be VP and now president because he done favors as a New York New York port duty collector. So uh, now people are going to be saying to this guy who is a product of the spoil system, now you need to do uh, something to fix the spoil system. It's a weird place for Chester Arthur to be. Um, you know, fixing something that got you where you are. Well, what Chester Arthur is going to end up doing, and this is to his credit, is he's going to work with Congress to pass something called the Pendleton Civil Service Act, the Pendleton Civil Service Act. What the Pendleton Civil Service Act is, it's going to be passed in 1882, is this is the first major government reform to end handing out jobs, handing out stuff to unqualified office seekers for political gain, things like that. What the Pendle Pendleton Civil Service Act says is that any government position, or just about any government position, before you can serve in this government position, you have to pass a competency exam. So if you want to become postmaster or post, a postal employee, if you want to become a duty collector, if you want to become whatever, tax collector, before you can get the job, you have to show that you know something about the job. You have to pass a test. Now, this isn't going to get rid of the spoil system entirely. You know, people are going to still hand out jobs to unqualified people, but the unqualified people at least have to have some level of intelligent intelligence and know enough about the job to pass these tests. So the Pendleton Civil Service Act will um, uh, will go into place and these competency exams will come out, passed by Congress. Arthur is going to um, uh, pass this into law. And again, this is interesting because he got his job by handing out um, uh, unqualified positions to to people that you know we're going to do in political favors. Now it's much harder to do because of Chester Arthur. Um, so Chester Arthur not going to get a whole heck of a lot else done during his presidency. A lot of people view him as illegitimate, only president because the other guy died. What he does get done though is going to be very representative of the Republican Party from this point forward. So with Garfield gone, that reform branch of the Republican Party is going to sort of go to the side, and we'll see this uh, pro-business part of the Republican Party will sort of come to the forefront, all right? And what pro-business Republicans are going to do is they're going to start doing things to grow U.S. businesses, okay? The way a lot of these pro-business Republicans view the future of the United States is that if the U.S. government supports U.S. big businesses, that will help these big businesses outcompete British big businesses, French big businesses, which means the U.S. will start to emerge as sort of the market leader in uh, certain industries. So under Chester Arthur and other pro-business Republicans, uh, we're going to see the government offer loans and subsidies to U.S. Uh, companies, large U.S. companies, to help them grow. Uh, we're going to see these guys do little regulation of business because they want to see these businesses grow because they think the bigger they are, the better they're going to compete on the uh, on the world stage. And another way they're going to help these businesses is to increase the tariff, incre increase duties on incoming manufactured goods. So whenever manufactured goods come from Britain, things like shoes, machines, stuff like that, when they get to the dock, Republicans are going to make sure that duty collectors connect, collect a significant portion of what the, the product's going to sell for, and they're doing this to artificially increase the price of these products. So uh, I want you to imagine if the United States wants people to buy Xboxes, so Xbox is produced by Microsoft American Company, 
what they hypothetically could do is whenever PS4s get to docks in the U.S., they charge 100% duty or whatever to make sure the cheapest PS4s can sell is for 800 bucks. Uh, the Xbox, you know, uh, sells for 400. Everybody's going to buy the Xbox. This helps out American company. Well, this thinking goes back a long time, uh, but the Republicans are going to uh, do this. These pro-business Republicans, uh, they're going to do it throughout this Gilded Age, but uh, they're going to kick it up a notch under Chester Arthur, uh, increase the, the tariff on incoming goods to promote American manufacturing. So this is going to be the uh, sort of motto of the Republican Party for the uh, Gilded Age, pro-business. That reform part is going to take a um, sort of a side seat after Garfield's assassination. Well, what are Democrats going to be like during this Gilded Age? Well, I think this is going to be best represented in this guy that is going to run for the presidency in 1884 for the Democrats, okay? So before I actually get to that, I want you to remember what the Democrats were during Reconstruction. Before that, essentially they were a small government party. They thought U.S. government should be there for military matters, I international diplomacy, but for the most part they thought states should have most of the legal power, most of the uh, power being in the states. There were northern Democrats who thought this, but this is really big before the Civil War in the South because we don't want the federal government taking away slavery and then post-Civil War because white southerners felt the government had overstepped their bounds uh, during Reconstruction. So basically, Democrats everywhere, you know, uh, north and south, are small government. They're very laissez-faire or hands-off. As a matter of fact, the Democratic Party is going to come to be known as this philosophy of the government should have little to no place in the economy. So think of Republicans as wanting to grow the economy, promote big business. Think of the Democrats as we're not going to hurt business, but we're also not going to help it. We believe the government should be laissez-faire, which means hands-off, okay? Nobody is going to represent this uh, laissez-faire philosophy better than this guy right here. This guy's name is Grover Cleveland. He's uh, from New York. Um, he is a Democrat. Um, he uh, is basically going to be running 1884. You don't need to know who the Republicans are going to run. They actually run James G. Blaine. They're not going to run Chester Arthur again because uh, a lot of people... You know, he shouldn't have been president anyway. But the Democrats are going to run this guy named Grover Cleveland, and he's going to be the embodiment of laissez-faire philosophy, okay? A little bit about Grover Cleveland, this Democrat whose spoiler is going to be the first Democrat elected president uh, post-Civil uh, War. Uh, Grover Cleveland was from a well-to-do family uh, in New York, became a lawyer. This is a very common theme with American presidents. A lot of them are from New York and Ohio. A lot of them are lawyers. Um, he served as a lawyer, had a private practice with a friend of his. Uh, eventually, he's going to become sheriff of Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York has a sheriff that's elected. Uh, Grover Cleveland's going to run for this office, going to become sheriff, and he's going to do a really good job. He actually cuts the budget significantly. He thinks the sheriff's office is too big. Uh, one of the things he does, and I think this is kind of an interesting fact about him, is he fires the guy who executes people you know, who who are uh, convicted of murder or whatever in order to be executed. Cleveland didn't want to pay this guy to execute, uh, to hang criminals. So Cleveland's going to say, I'll just do this myself so we can cut this job. And he hangs, he personally is the one that hangs them. So I need to check my numbers on this. But if you ever wonder which president killed the most people, you got like Andrew Jackson who killed like two men in a duel. You have, uh, who is it? Uh, I think Harry Truman in World War One and killed a couple people. Uh, Bush, uh, George Bush Sr. In, in World War II. Um, I think Grover Cleveland as executioner might have killed a lot of people. More people, just as sheriff. He actually... This is interesting because he didn't serve in the Civil War. He was so wealthy, he gets somebody to fight for him. That's something that's, that's kind of interesting. If you were wealthy enough, you, you could hire a replacement for you in the Civil War. So Grover Cleveland didn't kill anybody in the Civil War because he didn't serve. He's a lawyer, uh, but did kill people as an executioner. So a uh, very good job as a, a, as a sheriff. Um, so, such a good job that he's going to be elected mayor of Buffalo in 1882. 
1882, remember that. So this is going to be his first true elected position as, as mayor of Buffalo, New York. Well, as mayor of Buffalo, New York, he embodies his laissez-faire philosophy, reduces the size of government, and he's not going to be corrupt, which is something to say for politicians at this time. Uh, he's actually going to get rid of corruption in Buffalo, New York, uh, reduce the size of government. He's going to be so good at this that in 1883, the Democratic Party is going to nominate him for governorship of New York. He will be elected governor of New York, uh, and he's going to serve in this position for about a year, again, doing a good job of reducing the size of government and uh, cleaning up corruption. So at this point, 1884, he only has two years political experience. Two years political experience, but the Democrats are going to sign the 1884 election when they have their nominating convention, convention, we want this guy. That's crazy. A guy with only two years political experience is now going to be running for president. That almost never happens, anything like that. I mean, you, you know, usually you got to have a little bit of political experience. This guy has almost none. Now, this is going to be going against him. When he starts running, a lot of people are going to say, why do we want a guy with no experience? Some people are going to be arguing, didn't fight in the war. You know, we want a, a war here. We want a veteran. The rest of us had to fight. Why, why, why uh, can't he? Um, he's going to be the fact that he's a Democrat. You still have people in the North. Again, Democratic Party's been growing everywhere, uh, you know, sort of disassociating with the Party of the South thing. But a lot of people are going to look at him and say, you know, this is still the party of secession. So he's got this stuff going against him. Now, Democrats are going to come back and argue and say, well, you know, he doesn't have a lot of experience, but what experience he has is not corrupt. Um, he doesn't have fighting experience. Yeah, sure, he paid somebody to serve for him, but they also kind of look at that as going in their favor because they know northern voters are going to vote for him because uh, he's from the north, didn't fight for the south. Southern voters aren't going to turn away from him because he didn't fight for the union. So they actually look at that as a positive. So he's going to sort of deflect this criticism somewhat. But there's going to be one issue that's going to come up against Cleveland in this 1884 campaign that it kind of looks like it's going to sink them. And that's going to be news that, um, so this is his uh, Republican that he's running against, James G. Blaine. Don't worry about him. Uh, we're not going to talk about him. But the thing that's going to come against Grover Cleveland is word is going to be revealed in 1884 that Cleveland has had a child out of wedlock. Okay? So... The thing is, Democrats have been tra portraying Grover Cleveland as this good person. You know, no corruption, did a good job as mayor, did a good job as governor. They call him Grover the Good. Well, the Democrats actually first learned that the Republicans are going to reveal this information, or have learned this information, and they're going to ask Grover Cleveland, is this true? Did you have an extramarital affair? Now, Grover Cleveland been single his entire life. Uh, when he's running for president, he's something like 48, just never got married. Guy was kind of busy with his law practice, his uh, political affairs, but he did have relationships, and he's going to admit that one of these relationships was with this woman. She wasn't married, but uh, we did have sexual relations, and we did. Uh, she did give birth to a child. And he's going to say, I've been paying for the child, um, you know, I've been uh, uh, keeping in its life somewhat, but uh, but it is true. I did have this extramarital affair. Democratic Party leaders are actually going to tell Grover Cleveland, we can have this woman committed and we can say that this isn't true. And we can say she's just crazy. You know, this child, you know, we'll put in a different house. But Grover Cleveland is going to say to him, no, no, I this is true. I want to admit to it. Um, yeah, I, I did have sex with this woman, this is my child, and he's going to insist that Grover, that uh, the Democrats uh, tell the truth. Well, Republicans, they're going to reveal the information they learned about it as well. They think this is going to be their ticket to the White House because, ah, uh, you know, uh, uh, this guy had an extramarital affair, but instead the public's actually going to look at it, and the fact that Grover Cleveland was honest about it, they're going to say it's really not that big a deal. So, like, um, you know, Republicans try to come out and say, uh, ma, ma, where's my pa? Well, the Democrats are going to come back and say, off to the White House, ha, 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 you know. So they, they actually embrace the fact that he's being honest here, and the public does as well. So in the 1884 election, Grover Cleveland, this laissez-faire Democrat, this hands-off Democrat, uh, is going to win and become the first Democrat 
president uh, as a, uh, to serve in the White House. Now, when he gets into the White House, uh, uh, one of the first things, and we'll talk about his policies in just a second, is he actually is going to get married um, very, uh, very soon in the White House. And it's kind of interesting because the woman he's going to marry um, is actually, so this is how much he wins. You see here, Democrats win the South. This is going to be a constant theme here, winning the South. They're going to win a handful of these states up here. They win New York, and that, that, that's going to give them the presidency. But right after, he doesn't stay a bachelor for very long. He's going to marry this woman here. Her name's Frances Folsom which is interesting because that's my last name, and it's one of the few historical figures with my last name. The kind of disturbing thing about Frances Folsom, though, is that she's going to start this relationship with Grover Cleveland. At this point, when they get married, he's something like 50, and she's 21, okay? So that's a big age difference, you know, Maybe you can work around it. You know, we all like different kinds. I, I don't think that's as disturbing, but it's a little weird. The really disturbing thing is that Frances Folsom was Grover Cleveland's adopted daughter. So Frances Folsom was the daughter of Cleveland's old law partner. So uh, Cleveland had this law partner um, while they were had this law house together, um, his law partner. His wife gave birth to Francis Folsom. Grover Cleveland was present at the birth, um, and he's going to be, you know, near Francis Folsom when she's a kid. He's going to her dad's going to bring her to the law office. Uh, Grover Cleveland um, will actually take over as her primary male caregiver when she's 11 after his law partner dies, and he's going to serve as like the main father figure in her life from 11 to 21 until he marries her. So that's really weird and gross, but for whatever reason, they didn't make a big deal of that at the time. So well, I, I don't understand it, but, uh, you know, the famous, most famous Folsom person is, uh, is Frances Folsom. She's awesome, by the way, but it's just the circumstances around their married marriage are inc incredibly, incredibly weird. Um, so here's a, a cartoon of them being married right there. Um, and again, everybody thinks this is so cute at the time. Like, oh, they're, they're married and perfect couple. Uh, anyway, so Grover Cleveland, when he gets in the presidency, setting the personal stuff aside, he is absolutely going to be the epitome of what the Democrats are in the Gilded Age. Small, small government, laissez-faire philosophy. Stops with, um, you know, b basically stops uh, with the Republican uh, loaning out money to big business. He's going to work on lowering the tariff. Um, he's going to reduce the size of government as much as possible. As a matter of fact, right around the time he gets in office, you're going to see these Civil War veterans, veterans start applying for pensions. Cleveland doesn't want to pay clerks to uh, sign these pensions, and he's worried that some of these pensioners aren't deserving of pensions. So what Cleveland will start doing is he's actually going to review these pensions himself, the President of the United States, to see whether or not people deserve the pensions. All right, this guy deserves it, this guy doesn't. That's showing how small government he is, reducing the size of the government uh, uh, significantly. So this is the Democrats. The Republicans are pro-business. It's, it's very, let me just put it this way. Both parties are actually pro-business in their ways because as we're about to see, businesses appreciate the help from the government, but as long as the government doesn't restrict them, in which Democrats aren't going to restrict them because they don't think they have any part in the economy, that will end up helping these businesses. Another thing about Grover Cleveland and Republicans is these guys aren't going to view the government's responsibility as helping the individual. A lot of these guys, Republicans, think government's places in the economy, military matters, econ diplomatic matters, uh, Democrats, military matters, uh, dip diplomatic matters, but not economic matters, laissez-faire. Both of these guys are going to end up helping business with these philosophies. Neither of these guys are going to help the individual. And as we're going to see, the average Joe Schmo is going to face a lot of problems in the Gilded Age.